All right, uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Stephen Hambrick, and I'm from uh, Hambrick Acoustics LLC. That's just my uh, one man consulting company. Uh, you can find me at uh, www.hambrickacoustics.com. There's some other lecture videos you can find there, as well as a lot of uh, tutorials that are available for free download. So, and I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Andrew Bernard, my colleague. Uh, we put uh, these notes together. Uh, as a team uh, for a couple of different reasons, but uh, he has uh, assembled some of the material we see here today. And uh, this is all on behalf of PCB Piezotronics. So thank you to them for hosting this. And the talk is Pulses, Tones, and Wines, Understanding Electric Vehicle Noise and How to Measure It. And if you're wondering about the title, uh, the pulses come from inverters, and we'll talk about them. The tones, mainly from electric motors, and we'll learn about those. And the whines, a topic you're maybe more familiar with that comes from uh, transmissions and gears. And I'll talk about the general topics and then also what that means for the instrumentation you might need to measure. And a couple of new wrinkles to all of that. And for decades, our community has sorted out how to measure noise from internal combustion engines. And uh, all of that is slowly being overtaken by events as uh, the world transitions to electric vehicles. There's a heavy focus on passenger cars here today, but really the concepts I'll talk about to apply to any uh, vehicle that used to have an internal combustion engine and is now being electrified. And there's a couple things that are gonna happen. Some old sources we're familiar with are gonna become more important. And then of course, we'll have a bunch of new ones. So there's gonna be really a new prioritization um, of different sources for noise, vibration, and harshness, or NVH for short. So obviously, if you don't have an internal combustion engine, that is no longer an issue. Now, what the old ICEs did, particularly at high RPMs, they would mask some of the other noise sources that uh, are now becoming more audible, and especially over certain frequency ranges. And those are familiar sources. Uh, the road noise, anytime you drive over a, an uneven road, and all roads are uneven, you're going to be generating forces on the tires that will uh, then transmit uh, up through the, tra the um, mounting system and into the vehicle. Uh, they would also generate uh, some sound in the cavity underneath your car. I'll talk more about that in a bit. What we're Calling wind noise or just flow noise over the vehicle itself is becoming more and more important as the engine noise is gone. And then the noise coming out of your heating and ventilation system, out of the grills in your um, uh, car to keep it cool and hot, that is also becoming more and more important. You just hear it more. And so none of those sources have really changed. It's just all of a sudden they're becoming more prominent and people are noticing them in the electric cars. We're still going to have transmission noise. And that's coming from the gears. And that's going to be a little bit different. The uh, transmissions are not nearly as complicated in electric vehicles as they are in the old-fashioned cars. And then I'll focus mainly today on these new sources. Right? What comes out of the electric motors, and it's primarily a bunch of tones. And then there's something called an E-drive, and there's other abbreviations for that. But, but um, yeah, that's going to give you a lot of the inverter stuff, and um, that's going to generate some very interesting tones that uh, don't sound very good. And I should have mentioned this before I got started, but uh, as questions occur to you, type them into the chat. And at the end of the webinar, uh, Kristen will read them out to me, and then we'll try to answer as many as we can. An added complication, and, and this has really hasn't changed. Uh, weight is always a top priority for the vehicle industry, you know, especially for passenger cars. Um, and here, they're just trying to essentially reduce the time between charges, right? The more lightweight you can get, the longer you can travel before having to plug in. And that is currently a bone of contention between the electric vehicle crowd and the ICE crowd, right? You can only go 300 miles. And if you really step on the, uh, the accelerator, less than that, and that's a problem. So the, the community is trying to get past that by making things much lighter. Uh, the battery... Uh, just dominates everything. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. I mean, it's essentially sitting on top of this massive chunk of material. And uh, that just hogs everything. And when you come in as a noise control engineer and want to make things quieter or vibrate less, there's not a lot of margin uh, for you to add weight. So it, it just makes it tougher. But we're we're used to that lot in life as, as NVH engineers. So that's really nothing new. 
Uh, but but really, it's just going to be coming tougher and tougher to get good quality measurements and uh, go after and quantify specific um, electric vehicle and vehicle sources. Here's a little image that uh, we grabbed from um, the citation down below. It comes from Nissan. And this is just showing you where the battery is, right? And, and a lot of people will call this a skateboard vehicle design because it looks kind of like a skateboard. And um, that's where all the weight is. So it does you know, keep your center of gravity down, <laughs> which is good for stability. Uh, the other neat thing it does is that as you drive over distortions with your tires, you're generating a lot of forces that get transmitted up into the car, but you're also kind of generating noise from the tires themselves. And I'm not going to get into that metric here, but that noise then travels underneath that cavity under your car. And there are acoustic resonances within that cavity. And uh, those resonances get excited and transmit really well into the car. So you kind of hear this low frequency um, road noise, at least in the old cars, because nobody wanted to put any mass down there to block them. Sometimes you'd see a constraint layer damping treatment, but that had kind of minimal, minimal benefit. But here, you've got this huge blocking mass. So uh, this kind of that airborne noise isn't as big a deal. And uh, really, it, it, road noise boils down to the uh, forces that are induced on the wheels from the road. And there are different roughness profiles you can uh, kind of estimate. And there's ways of calculating that. But here, we're talking about measurements. And so you're looking at uh, force and load cells, if you're allowed to put them in there, preferably somewhere in the, the transmission path as close to the source as possible. Uh, a lot of people are interested in uh, power transfer methods, SEA, things like that, where you need to know how much power is being transferred in. Uh, you can uh, measure that directly with impedance heads, where you've got a force measurement, as well as a fluctuating velocity measurement. And as long as those are properly phase matched, which they are when you get them, then you can uh, directly uh, measure the amount of power that's being transmitted through that impedance head and up into the vehicle. And the usual suspects, accelerometers and microphones are still of use in this sort of a problem, particularly if you can get some microphones uh, at key locations in the cavity and then do some uh, um, multi-sensor power uh, coherent measurements, right? Just pull out the signal at the driver's ear that is coherent with the uh, source measurements you're making with either the load cells, or if you can't afford those, the accelerometers that you put down near the source. So that hasn't changed. It's just one thing has gone away, and that's that cavity under the car is no longer as important. Wind noise, this has always been there, and the faster you go, the, the louder that's going to be. And uh, there's really a couple of different things that are causing this. Uh, one is what we'll call the aerodynamic effect. So this is separating and reattaching flows as well as self-generated boundary layers on the roof, the side windows, the A-pillars. There's been a lot of work done on this. But you're getting these uh, pulsating aerodynamic pressures that are, think about them as running over your roof and the side of your car uh, from front to back. And uh, the speed at which they're running obviously depends on the vehicle speed. And it's going to be some fraction of that, usually 70% of the vehicle speed, something like that. And um, that, that will generate a lot of vibration in the structural part of your car. And that's going to re-radiate sound into the interior. The other mechanism is that messy flow is also generating sound outside the vehicle. So you're getting these acoustic pressure pulsations. And uh, they're impinging on your windows and the ceiling. And that also uh, generates sound inside a vehicle. And sometimes it's a little tough to distinguish between these two mechanisms. They sound the same but they're really different, right? One is aerodynamic speed and one is uh, sonic speed, I'd say. Uh, the usual instrumentation for going after that mechanism would be uh, if you can do them on uh, some test vehicles, wall-mounted pressure sensors in the exterior of the car, uh, where you suspect your flows are reattaching. That's usually the most important point. You can use computational fluid dynamics or wind tunnel measurements to kind of try to find those locations, but as the flow separates, you get kind of a quiet zone, and then when it reattaches, that's when all the excitation happens. And then getting back to the re sound radiation part, uh, that actually takes some pretty involved CFD compressible flow calculations to kind of estimate where the uh, sound waves are impinging. But uh, wall-mounted pressure sensors will give you that, particularly if you can get an array on there. And then if you have a reasonably wide separation between sensors, you can look for how fast that pressure pulsation is, is convecting, see if it looks like sonic speeds or see if it looks like convecting speeds. 
into your microphones at the usual locations. And in particular, you can try some coherent power processing here, but it's not going to work terribly well because a lot of the pressure pulsations, they're incoherent over the surface. And what's really getting inside is uh, kind of the combination of all of that exciting the walls. So it's coherent processing is not a, a great method for, for this sort of a noise mechanism. Um, accelerometers, put them on your window, put them on the roof panel, uh, those can help as well. And uh, if you've got access to some nice wind tunnel facilities that uh, can make this uh, problem a little bit easier, uh, there's a couple of large aeroacoustic wind tunnels that uh, PCB partners with. Uh, one is the one from Honda. Uh, they call it Halo, and that's in Ohio. And there's also a Ford Motor uh, tunnel that's under Dearborn that's quite nice as well. HVAC noise, uh, these are from interior fans inside your ducting. And uh, if you've ever worked with interior ducting, uh, those essentially become waveguides at low frequencies, one dimensional acoustic paths. So any sort of a fan source, uh, which is usually gonna be a dipole inside your, your ducting system, is gonna drive a bunch of acoustic modes, 1D acoustic modes in that system, and it's just gonna radiate sound right out the end exit and into the interior. You're also going to get uh, the flow past the grills, we'll hear that as well. Uh, so it's really two main sources, the flow noise being generated by the fan inside the ducting and then propagating out, and then the flow over the exit grills. Uh, to uh, go after those, more flush matter pressure sensors. And by the way, there is a, a webinar we did last fall on um, different types of microphones and how they're best suited for different kinds of measurements. And the ones I'm talking about here, they go flush into the wall, and it will generate the uh, plane waves that are propagating past. And then uh, microphones, obviously, inside the interior. And in this case, you can do some coherent processing because these kinds of uh, duct sources, anyway, are very coherent. Uh, you only need a couple locations, really, to capture them. And then you can see how correlated it is what's going on at the driver's ear, the passenger, passenger's ear, for example. OK, those are the traditional sources. Let's move on to some of the newer ones. And uh, this I'll call quasi-new. We, we've always had transmission noise, but now the transmissions are a little bit simpler. Uh, they're usually one stage. Some of the newer vehicles are going to two stage, so they're starting to get more complicated, but you don't need as much reduction in these electric vehicles that you do in combustion engines. And uh, the whole point is that uh, the engine rotation speeds are gonna be quite high, and uh, we need to reduce the speed at which we're transmitting power to the axles quite a bit. The usual ratio for EVs has been on the order of eight to 12 to one. Some go a little bit higher. And uh, what you're gonna get are a bunch of tones from this meshing. So any gear-based transmission is imperfect. I mean, it'll transmit the static force very, very well, but the gears are not rigid. So as they spin past each other, they are slowly deflecting and then undeflecting. And you get kind of an interesting deformation on the gear tooth surface. It's called Hertzian deformation. And it is highly nonlinear. And so you're going to get two things. Number one, a tone that occurs at something we call the gear meshing frequency. And that's related to the RPM of, of just one of these times number of blades uh, or uh, gear teeth. And uh, it'll be the same in this other um, shaft. So it'll be a different RPM, but a, a smaller number of gear teeth. So these meshing frequencies are the same, and that's what gives you, gives you the RPM reduction. Um, so you get a tone at that frequency. You're also, because of that Hertzian contact, going to get an amplitude modulation. So you're not going to get a pure sine wave out of this. You're going to get this distorted modulating sine wave. And that is going to cause a very characteristic whine. Um, anytime you hear that uh, sort of a noise source, you know right away it's from a gear. There are also bearings in these transmissions. Uh, if they're a rolling element, you can get uh, some tones associated with the RPM and the number of balls. And there's also things associated with the inner race and the outer race. There's a, just a lot of different bearing tones you can get out of these. And usually they're not that big a deal unless your bearing's going bad or unless the distributor dropped these things on the way to the plant and you get a dent in one of your balls of the rooms and then you're gonna hear it <laughs> loud and clear. So. Uh, you're going to get some tones associated with that as well. 
Uh, the type of instrumentation you're after here, typically what you want to do is put uh, accelerometers on the uh, transmission housing. The housing will radiate sound. I'm not showing the housing for these guys here, but they'll have a housing as well. Uh, they're usually either cylindrical or curved in interesting ways. So those curved surfaces can lead to some pretty strong, uh, what we call radiation efficiencies. So these guys can radiate very well uh, at certain harmonics and certain frequencies. And more on that coming up when we get to the motors. We we'll have the same sort of an issue there. And then uh, microphones in the engine cavity, and then obviously inside the, uh, the car can be used to try to correlate, right? Again, getting back to coherent analysis uh, between uh, the source in your transmission and inside the vehicle. But once again, the, these sorts of tones are usually easy to find. You just, you know your gear meshing frequencies. You typically know rolling element bearing fault frequencies, we call them. So when you hear those inside the compartment, it, it's pretty easy to know where they're coming from. So once again, uh, this is essentially a big uh, cylindrical shell, and it's going to have a bunch of harmonics. So we call uh, N harmonics around the circumference. The dominant one will be breathing. We call it N equals zero. And then we just go up from there. And uh, you could probably spend a whole webinar just on cylindrical shell vibration and sound. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of different frequencies. So what's going to happen is these tones, if they overlap a particularly strong housing uh, mode, you know, that tone is going to really light up. And since these are variable speed, different conditions will lead to different tones standing up. And so that can be kind of annoying, right? If you're getting um, in the old internal combustion engines where you had the engine noise, it was a very well understood kind of uh, series of tones and you got used to them and we've kind of grew up with them. These are a little bit different. And uh, when they're sporadic, they can become quite annoying. You think something's wrong, right? Take it into the dealer and hey, something's wrong. I'm hearing this weird tone, but it's just a, a mechanism of uh, what's happening. You'll get different frequencies and tones, uh, depending whether you're just at forward operation, just driving away down the highway, or if you're braking. So one of the things that goes on in these electric vehicles is they'll use the braking energy to repower the batteries. So you're getting power regeneration and the gears spin backwards. So, and that will give you, depending on what the gear teeth look like, maybe some different amount of Hertzian contact, different tones. Uh, it's not always the same amplitude forward and back. So that's just something else to keep in mind. Here is a very high level breakdown of where the noise is coming from, from an E-drive. These are just general trends. So this is not hard and fast. Uh, but we've got frequency down in the bottom axis uh, from one kilohertz. We're kind of starting there and then going up to eight. And uh, this is a rough estimate of percentage of noise. Power transmission tends to be below around five kilohertz. That's going to be our, our gearboxes. And then the new stuff we're going to talk about coming out, the inverter um, and the motor. Uh, tend to uh, kind of dominate up here. I think the uh, inverter is probably a little bit stronger. I'm getting a note my internet connection is unstable. Can everybody still hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good, okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, but uh, motor and inverter are going to dominate up around uh, above five kilohertz and probably even above eight. Let's move on to the E-Drive electric motor stuff. And uh, I've got a few um, kind of different boxes here to walk through. And it really all starts with a battery. So right now, mainly lithium ion, but that is changing over time. And once again, that's uh, down under your frame, kind of like the skateboard. And these have very high energy density. And that just means there's a lot of energy and power in there compared to the uh, footprint that it takes up, essentially it's volume. A typical amount of voltage that we're getting out of these is in the range of 400, 800 hertz of volts, but it just keeps going up. And uh, that is uh, DC. So you need to find some way to take that power and voltage and convert it into a, a certain amount of uh, fluctuating voltage and current uh, for AC drive. So we need an inverter. The normal way it's done now is using something called pulse width modulation or PWM. And uh, when you see this as a bunch of noise people, you're going to be horrified if you haven't seen this before. This, <laughs> this is a mess. Uh, it works, but it is uh, loud and obnoxious, so we say. Uh, the inverters uh, typically range in uh, between 80 and a couple hundred kilowatts. 
And the main focus for these inverters is to minimize power loss and also to um, ensure long life. Noise is not high on their list, so as, as you'll see in a moment. So what we're going to get is kind of a messy looking sine wave. It's not going to be pure at all. And that's going to be fed into the motor. It's usually three phase, but you can go more phase. And uh, what that means is you're feeding that uh, voltage and current into three different loops inside the motor. And they're all separated by, uh, if it's three phase, 120 degrees in phase. So that you'll offset the phasing coming in. And uh, there's different kinds of motors. You could probably do a whole webinar and, and then some on all the different types of motors that are out there. But uh, we're just going to talk mainly about AC motors that are either synchronous or asynchronous. If you want a rough order of magnitude on how much sound power a motor system like this uh, puts out, uh, here's a, a simple number for you. And this is really only going to give you um, essentially a, a, a rough relational ratio. So what I'm going to do here is mainly focus on the motor source. So the total amount of sound power, you really have to add up the power that comes from the electromagnetic noise. And this is from really everything. Uh, the cooling system, which we talked about before, so that's in blue. And then uh, this would be from bearings, um, uh, things like that, the uh, transmission. But since we're talking about motors here, Something that can be helpful to you is uh, how much power is coming out of the motor as a function of the motor voltage. And it's proportional to essentially 40 log of the motor voltage. And so just in simple, dumb terms, if you're able to reduce that motor voltage, in this case, by 50%, plug that into my V to the fourth power law, then I can reduce the power level that comes from that source by about 12 dB. So just... Quick scaling, which can be helpful for you. Now, obviously, the total power depends on all of this. And so if a particular condition, the cooling or rotational power is higher than the motor, then you're not going to hear much of a difference in total power. But if the motor is dominating, then you certainly will. I'm going to talk about inverters first and then motors second. And once again, you're not going to get a perfect sine wave out of this. So I'll show you an example in a moment. And uh, the imperfections in the wave that's coming out are going to be at something called the switching frequency of the inverter. And that's essentially the rate at which you're turning on and off the pulses. And since you're putting imperfect sinusoids into your motors, those are going to propagate through the motor in different kinds of ways. And that's going to depend on your motor as well. And more on that in a bit. So generally what you see is a cluster of high frequency tones. They're usually around 10 kilohertz and they're particularly annoying to humans. I'll talk about why that is in a moment. And these are tough to measure. Number one, they're at higher frequencies than uh, you might be used to. And the big one, once you start getting around these uh, E-drive systems, you can find a lot of electromagnetic interference, both static as well as alternating. And this is true around the motors as well. And so if any of that electromagnetic field, fluctuating uh, magnetism current gets into your sensor, right? These are essentially you know, electrical sensors. They're going to they're gonna feel that and uh, generate false voltages in the signal that does go into your acquisition system. And, and you don't want that. If you're getting particularly high static EMI, that can completely swamp everything, right? Essentially just blow away your dynamic range. And all you're seeing is this big ski slope of output and it's just swapping everything that's uh, coming out. This can happen to your sensor, and it can really happen to your wiring. So if your wiring is not well shielded, and you know, just typical shielding may not be enough, depending on what your EMI field is, um, yeah, that'll trash your measurements as well. So you need to shield your sensors commonly, uh, and certainly as well as your cabling. Uh, the good news is this EMI field is usually... Uh, rapidly decays away from its source. I mean, really rapidly, much more fast than acoustic waves do. So uh, if you're having trouble, a simple remediation could be just moving all your wires as far away as you possibly can uh, from that. Uh, there are instances, and I've seen these before, where uh, there's certain ports where your instrumentation wiring goes out, and, uh, or I should say, uh, like wiring for the, the vehicle comes out. 
and that can be highly electrified. And uh, sometimes you'll just say, hey, I'm going to run my instrumentation wiring right next to those because there's a port I can just kind of feel it through, right? That's generally a bad idea because, again, you're going to get a lot of um, EMI interference. So it, it's tough, but sometimes you need to have your own exclusive um, exit port for your instrumentation wiring that's far away from any electrical uh, wiring. Here is uh, a couple of models sold by PCB where they've isolated a case. And what to look for in your cal sheet is in the electrical section, you'll find uh, the electrical isolation section if your instrument is isolated. And uh, so that's a lot of ohms. That's good. <laughs> so uh, that is well isolated. You should be pretty comfortable putting that on. But once again, keep an eye on your cabling as well. Let's talk about if you don't know how a pulse width modulated inverter works. And I did find kind of a neat example online that I like quite a bit. And uh, it involved kind of playing with like a house fan, like maybe a ceiling fan or something like that. And when you turn on your ceiling fan, eventually it revs up to a certain speed and just kind of stays there. But what if you wanted to run that fan at a much lower RPM? So a way of doing it, not an efficient way, but a way of doing it would be to go by your, your fan switch and just turn it on and off, on and off, on and off, but leave it on for slightly longer amounts of time over time and then leave it on a little bit shorter and leave it on a little longer. Just kind of keep flipping that switch with different intervals of how long you leave it on. And if you're good, eventually you can kind of make that fan rotate at a much lower speed. It's going to be herky-jerky, but that's what pulse width modulation does, right? It's essentially, it's a bunch of on and off square waves. Um, here's an example of a single sine wave. And by the way, these little images come to you courtesy from the INSUSA course on noise control engineering. So I know some of you have probably taken that uh, course, uh, but if you haven't, uh, I can get you certified as a noise control engineer here in the U.S., so look for that at insusa.org. Uh, but here is the example of a, a frequency transform of a simple, pure sine wave. So one frequency, and you get a, a nice total amplitude over frequency here. But here's what a square wave gives you, right? It's got the same kind of frequency as the sinusoid, but uh, these sudden discontinuities just give you a bunch of harmonics. So you're generating a main frequency frequency as well as a bunch of uh, overtones. So here are the definitions for a modulated square wave. And so I've got to off down here on the bottom and on up here at the top. So I turn it on for a certain amount of time. That's going to be my pulse width. And I turn it off and it's off for a certain amount of time. Then I turn it on. So the time between when I turn these on is called the cycle time. This is not the same as the frequency I'm going to get out on the other side. That's going to be different. So this is actually the uh, what we call the switching frequency of the pulse width modulated. So the next step is varying the pulse widths. So we're not going to use constant pulse widths anymore. And essentially how long they're, they're on is what it really means. So this comes out of Wikipedia. There's a nice little uh, description of that if you want to, to dig into it more. And uh, I've got a voltage and uh, current up on top here, different colors. So each of these voltages, I'm turning it on for a certain amount of time, then I turn it off, a little bit less, turn it off, a little bit less, turn it off. Now I'm going to change my phase, right? We go this way. Apply negative voltage for a little less time, negative voltage for a little longer time, negative voltage longer still. So you get the idea, right? You're, you're kind of standing at the switch and turning things on and off at different rates. And you're generating this pseudo sine wave here in red. And so the modulation comes from the modulation of how long you're turning these on and off and when they're going positive and negative. So you're, you're modulating the pulse width. And you can imagine you're going to get a pretty ugly looking frequency transform out of that red curve. Here's a nice little cartoon of uh, the different kinds of tones you can expect to hear in an electric vehicle. And two of them we're kind of used to as humans, the other one we're not. Uh, so for typical motors, which we'll talk about in a minute, those tones are generally going to go up in frequency as you increase RPM. And again, that's something humans are used to. You step in the accelerator and all of a sudden the frequencies go up and that makes sense. Right? You, you buy that. 
Every now and then you're going to go through a structural or an acoustic resonance. Those are these vertical peaks here. They do not vary in frequency with RPM, but anytime you get an intersection between a resonance and some sort of a harmonic, you generally get some amplification and it's more audible. Here's the new one. This is what you get out of pulse with modulated um, inverters. At low RPM, you're going to get kind of a single frequency. And as you ramp up the RPM, you're going to get pairs of frequencies, kind of about a center frequency here, right? You're essentially you're switching frequency, and then you're going to get all of these side tones, right, based on the, uh, the pulse width modulation. And this is not something people are used to. This is uh, non-intuitive. Some people call it inharmonious, discordant, whatever terms you want. Um, this is not something we like. <laughs> and it happens to be right in the frequency range, you know, around 8, 10 kilohertz. It's uh, particularly annoying. So you're going to hear that from the inverter, but you're also passing that right into the motor. And some of those tones get amplified. Some will be attenuated. And all of that depends on the motor geometry, how big the housing is, how thick the housing is, the radiation efficiency of those housing modes. It's a complicated analysis for sure. And I can't emphasize this enough, those uh, inverters, the people that design those don't care about noise and vibration. And I shouldn't say that, but most of them don't. What they're really after is they want to minimize the power loss because that process is pretty inefficient. Right? You're trying to get that efficiency up as high as you can so you're not you're giving away power and lost heat or just lost um, energy going into uh, harmonics that are not driving the motor. The other thing is stress, right? So the more cycles you're putting on this thing, the faster you're going to wear that motor out. So that's another uh, issue that they think about. So not only are they trying to minimize power loss, but they don't want you to have to buy a new motor every couple of years. So all of those things tend to go counter to minimizing noise. Once again, you're looking between 8 and 12 kilohertz that are highly audible and uh, extremely annoying. Once again, uh, inharmonious, so it's kind of a musical term. Right? You think about uh, guitars or pianos and all these frequencies are in harmony with each other, doubling of frequencies, things like that. And this is not that. <laughs> you're not getting integer multiples at all. Uh, the other thing that can happen is that uh, if you've got a couple of harmonics that are really close to each other in frequency, you know, 8.1 kilohertz, 8.2 kilohertz, something like that. That can happen. And uh, that kind of manifests itself as something we call beating, right? You hear that tone get louder than quieter, louder than quieter, and that can drive people nuts. And uh, finally, that sound can kind of move around on you in, a, in space, right, around the driver's ear. You can uh, hear something we call binaural sound. And if it sounds like it's moving around, that's even more annoying to people. Uh, a way of kind of plotting that is just to uh, take the signal you've got on one ear, signal you've got on the other ear, and just kind of plot that. And um, if you're getting just this pure diagonal line here, then you're pretty steady, right? You're, you're not seeing a, a much of drift back and forth between one ear and the other. If it's doing this red, <laughs> then you got a problem. Uh, that's really going to be uh, annoying to people. And once again, just remember that uh, little cartoon I had a few slides ago. The, the frequencies are not always proportional to vehicle speed. They're inharmonious. And uh, just you know, different is, is sometimes bad. Now, I suspect in a couple of generations, yeah, maybe this isn't as big a deal. And there's another thing that may not make this a big deal also that I'll talk about at the very end of the lecture. But uh, for now, it is uh, kind of annoying to folks. Let's move on to motors. So these are alternating current motors. There are some DC motors being uh, thought about out there, but I'm not going to get into those here. But um, there's just constant development going on and trying to make a better motor, more efficient motor. Um, so things are rapidly, rapidly changing. But uh, the main idea is this. You're going to feed in a fluctuating voltage and current into something we call a stator. So this is a cross-sectional view of a motor, and this is kind of looking end on. And what you have is uh, usually a bunch of uh, windings. So this is copper wire that just kind of goes in and out, in and out, and in and out. Just, just Google AC motor stator online. You'll see some pictures of it. And uh, again, you're feeding the current in. It's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, a different phasing. And then what you have on the inside, this is the spinning part. The st stator is stationary, as it, as it sounds, and the rotor is rotary. Um, you'll either have a bunch of new windings or sometimes you'll have permanent magnets, but just something 
that is going to react to that fluctuating electromagnetic current and and um, magnetic field that you're inducing in the air gap. So there's a really narrow gap between the stator and the rotor. And when you run that current through here, you're generating a, uh, an EMI field in that gap that winds up spinning that rotor around in a particular direction, depending on what phase you're using. So that is the drive mechanism. It's through that air gap. And I mentioned earlier that these fields decay really quickly with distance. I believe it goes as R squared, right? Separation distance squared. And so that gap winds up becoming quite small. And this is kind of analogous to what we had for gears. You're going to get a good transmission of, of power, but it's going to be imperfect. And that is due to the motor features. So uh, how many poles you have. So these are like different amounts of pull north, south. So this would be a, a four pole motor, we would call it. And uh, most motors have a lot more than four poles, but uh, this is just a simple cartoon out of the INS course to, to get the point across. But um, the more poles you have, you know, in general, the smoother that transmission is going to be, but it still will be imperfect. It's going to be a distorted sinusoid. And you're going to have a whole bunch of harmonics in there due to motor parameters, which we're not going to get into here, but um, they'll be imperfect as well. And if you top that off with an imperfect incoming current from the uh, inverter, then you're dumping even more tones in. So you hear this combination of inverter tones as well as motor generated tones. So it's a mess <laughs> to say the least. And uh, sometimes when you look at the um, you know frequency spectra from these motors, it's hard to tell one tone from the other. There's just so many of them. Uh, one other thing I'll mention in a lot of the analysis, if you do are in the analysis so world, assume that you've got a constant gap all the way around the circumference. And that rarely happens. There's always something, some sort of a side load, just something that happens that makes this gap uh, non-perfectly eccentric. A little bit of an offset. And when you do that, you introduce even more tones. So not to make it too uh, scary sounding, but uh, yeah, motor noise is a very complicated field for sure. There are some quick and dirty estimating procedures out there if you're interested. And we've pulled a couple of them out of the book, uh, Noise Control Engineering from Bees, Hansen, and Howard. And I've got one uh, set of equations here for small motors, less than 300 kilowatts. And they kind of break them down into really small, less than 40 kilowatts, or uh, between 40 and 300. And uh, this is actually in terms of pressure. So it's the pressure at one meter. And uh, again, these are very empirical numbers. They essentially come from a lot of measurements that the the authors made of different kinds of motors over time and curve fits they've done to them. So we have uh, essentially a DC offset, if you will, and the, the dB level. And then you have a 17 log of power here. For larger motors, there's a 10 log of power. So a little bit different scaling there and a bit different from the simple equation we had earlier. So these are smaller motors. And then we have a 15 log of RPM. So these will get you in the ballpark, but I uh, wouldn't take them as absolute. And uh, this is a total pressure level. If you want to come up with a little third octave or actually full octave band uh, spectrum from that, then uh, here are some corrections that you subtract from the overall sound power level. So compute that. And then, for example, at 63 hertz and uh, for enclosed fan cooled uh, motor, you would subtract 14 dB to get to what that is. And then the sweet spot is going to be up here. Uh, between 500 hertz and about a couple of kilohertz. Large motors, this is above uh, 300 kilowatts. And a little bit different here, instead of an equation, we just have a table and uh, different uh, RPMs. And then if, if you've got um, motors in the range of 300 to 750 kilowatts, knock 3 dB off of that. If you go over 4 megawatts, then add 3 dB. So if you want to get a rough idea and kind of compare it to other noise sources that you may be uh, working with, a wind, a road, or something like that, this will at least tell you whether you may have a problem or it's not going to be a problem. We haven't talked about this, but uh, you charge your vehicle, and uh, that usually involves some sort of a transformer, which is taking the AC power from the charger and converting it into a DC input to your batteries. And uh, these things are usually cooled, and not always. So we've got a, a breakdown in terms of uh, approximate sound power levels. 
and this is in power, by the way, not uh, pressure at a location, uh, depending on whether you have a fan or not. So the fan generally adds you know, 5 to 10 dB or something like that, depending on your frequency range. And uh, then you've got what we're calling super quiet core, <laughs> uh, whatever that is. I'm not an expert on transformer noise, but uh, just thought I'd have that in there in case somebody was interested in it. <laughs> So we've talked about a bunch of really complicated things that could easily have entire webinars or short courses devoted to them, but uh, try to give you an idea of what they are. And losing that internal combustion engine noise just really unmasks a lot of traditional sources that now need more attention, the road noise, the wind noise, the HVAC noise. And then you got these new sources, the motors, uh, the E-drive, pulse width modulation, and then you still have transmission noise, but it's a little bit different than it was for a combustion engine. You still need a lot of the same sensors you used to, microphones, accelerometers, for road noise, uh, some impedance heads, load cells if you got them. But the big thing here is you're dealing with a highly electromagnetic system. And you, if you have sensors right on top of those components, you need to make sure they're shielded. And if you're running cable past any of those components, or if you're running out a port that has a lot of uh, power cables in them, you need to make sure those uh, wires are shielded uh, much, much more strongly than maybe a typical one would be. A caveat, as I was looking into this, I was just amazed at, uh, if you look at something that you find online from like 10 years ago versus five years ago versus now, just how quickly things are changing. I mean, this is just blowing up, uh, not surprising, it's a hot technology, but uh, one of the big things that is constantly being improved are the power converters. And it is conceivable that uh, within a few years, the switching frequencies, right, how fast you're turning off those pulses could be above the range of human hearing. And then all that stuff that we talked about just becomes unimportant. And if you can't hear it, <laughs> we don't care. Um, the other thing about motors is a lot of focus has been on permanent magnet motors, but uh, that has an environmental concern to it, right? You're, you're mining in countries that uh, we don't necessarily like doing business with all the time. And it is also just environmental costs. So motors are changing too. So the mechanisms I talked about are going to shift into maybe other ones. I can see in the hunt for <clears throat> more and more power efficiency, the transmission is getting more and more complicated. I don't think they'll get all the way to the complication that we have in internal combustion engines, but um, yeah, more two-stage transmissions are definitely on the way and we'll see if they go to three or not. So, so the bottom line is that we may be changing webinar nodes pretty often over the years just to keep up with uh, what's going on out there. If you're interested in some of the references, uh, here they are. I'll sit on this page uh, during the question and answer period. Um, I don't think we're making these notes generally available, but uh, we can probably uh, grab these references and put them in uh, some sort of uh, uh, wherever we um, archive the recorded version of this later if people are interested in it. So that's it for my overview. We definitely have some time for questions uh, that uh, once again, plug them into the chat. And Kristen can share them with me. Kristen, can you read them out? Or actually, I, was I see say, one. Steve, can, I was going to just ask if you could see the one that came through. Okay. Yeah, I have a pretty involved one. Uh, let's see. This is from uh, Vibor. I'm running a speed sweep and analyzing the NVH characteristics of an electric motor, 72 teeth, and four pole pairs. This is an experimental test with accelerometer microphone. As per the motor design, 72 order should have been dominated, but instead of that order, 68 and 76 are dominating the NVH. Okay, well, that is modulation and not surprising. Um, and it also can sometimes depend on where you're making the measurement, whether you're in the relative frame or the absolute frame. So I don't know if you're sitting on top of a spinning component or whether you're sitting on top of a stationary component, but that can cause this um, kind of a difference in the order that you're seeing, right? It could be in one frame of reference, you're going to see exactly 72, and in the other frames of reference, you're going to see this uh, 68 and 76. So this kind of thing happens all the time in motors. And if you go grab a you know kind of a motor NVH uh, handbook or book, it should give you a breakdown of all the kinds of harmonics you can expect to get from different mechanisms. And um, there are a lot of different ones. Uh, you get radial forces, you get tangential forces, um, cogging. There's all these crazy tones that can happen. 
So sorry for the the vague answer, but uh, that what you're seeing does not surprise me. Okay, I've got another question here. Um, what's the difference between pressure sensors, technologies, and microphones for measuring on vehicle surface in a wind tunnel? Right. So there's a whole other webinar on that, which I encourage you to go to, but it's uh, understanding microphones. Uh, we can probably um, also put a link to that when we post this. But uh, the uh, flush mounted sensors are actually designed right, to pull out the kinds of uh, pressures that you're getting uh, within a uh, one dimensional ducting system. Whereas the regular free field microphones, that, that's kind of meant for uh, freely propagating noise. You generally aim it at your source is what it's meant for. Um, but uh, yeah, the flush mounted is, is meant for picking up not only noise and ducts, but uh, will also pick up the uh, pressures that are coming from uh, messy turbulent flows over your surface, whether they're aerodynamic or whether it's from the sound that's radiated by those flows. You'll pick that up uh, from the surface pressures. So if I didn't answer that uh, well, let me know. Uh, another one here is uh, how high in frequency does it make sense to measure for noise generated by high gear mesh frequencies, uh, considering the human hearing audible range? And uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of different ways of looking at that. One would be if you're trying to meet a spec, right? And that, that happens all the time. Like the automotive company might contract out to somebody to make your transmission, and it tells you you can have a, uh, a sound pressure level less than some dBA. So if it's A-weighted, there's your answer right there. Once you get above about uh, 8 to 10 kilohertz or something like that, the uh, A-weighting curve rolls off pretty quick. And uh, at some point, the amplitudes times your A-weighting uh, really becomes insignificant when you're trying to meet a dBA. If you're trying to be a little more rigorous and you know that these kinds of tones may not do much to your dBA level, but are going to be particularly annoying, you know, then you might want to go up higher. You know, a 16-ish kilohertz is probably as high as you probably care about. Uh, in theory, you can go to 20 for like the people that just have superhuman hearing, but a lot of people, it, it rolls off pretty quick. So 10-ish um, kilohertz normally, and if you've got something that's particularly annoying, maybe go up a little higher. Uh, any follow-ups to the first two or any new ones? And I'm sitting here on the chat so I can see them. Okay, here's another one. Um, how to measure properly noise in ducks? Right. Uh, really, all you need is a flush mounted pressure transducer. And uh, if you've got a, a noise source like a fan, it's going to generate plane waves in that duct. So it really doesn't matter where around the circumference you put it. Uh, one thing to think about is if there is a particular resonant frequency of a 1D plane wave mode in that ducting system, um, you might have to think about where you put it along the the axis of the duct, if you will, right? To kind of view the duct as a one long, uh, one dimensional system. Uh, you have a fan in one location and uh, really the output that matters most is gonna be coming out. But you wanna make sure that you put that microphone or, or flush mounted pressure transducer location where there's a strong pressure in that uh, one dimensional plane wave. And sometimes that takes a little bit of thinking to kind of pull out. And if you're not quite sure, Probably the best thing to do is have two or three of them kind of flush mounted along a line, different distances from the fan. And in general, you want to make sure you don't use uniform spacing, because if there is a particular resonant frequency that you're, you're missing, because maybe you put the microphone at a, a dead spot, uh, if you use uniform spacing, you're just every microphone is going to be in another dead spot, potentially. So typically we use something called logarithmic spacing. So maybe go to your fan, go uh, stay a, a half a wavelength or more away, and then maybe instead of one wavelength away plot a log curve and 1.23 wavelengths away uh, 1.98 wavelengths i'm just making these numbers up but you just don't want a uniform spacing and as long as you got two or three of them in there you should pick up every acoustic resonance inside that duct 
And one other complication you can have there is uh, if the flow through that duct is particularly fast, you're going to measure it, right? So that uh, flush matter pressure transducer will measure the acoustic waves. It'll also measure the turbulent flows, which you may or may not care about. Usually you don't. Um, so if you go back to the uh, microphone webinar, I talked about a couple of things you can do to, to filter those out. So I encourage you to head back and find that online. You should be able to find it on PCB. And once again, we'll try to post a link to that underneath the recording for this uh, whenever it does get uh, posted. Okay, I have one more question here. Um, is the influence of road type even more important for EV versus IC? Influence of road type. <clears throat> I would say that it um, kind of depends on the frequencies that you're generating. So it'd be, when you think about road type, you kind of look at the uh, profile of the road surface and uh, you can actually do like a, a wave number analysis of that and then relate that to the speed at which you're traveling and get a pretty good idea of the dominant frequency range of sound you're gonna generate. And you've noticed this when you're driving on the highway yourself now, driving on concrete, and different kinds of asphalt generates very different kind of frequency ranges or bands of, uh, of sound. And um, in the past with the internal combustion engine, the engine has its own sweet spot, right? A certain frequency range of sound. So if your road noise coincided with that, you might not have heard it so much. So I would have to dig around a little bit and kind of think about what different road profiles, asphalt, concrete, et cetera, what dominant frequency ranges they'd have how that compares to the old internal combustion engines versus now. And uh, that might influence my answer. So essentially what I answered is, is a way to get there, but I can't give you the answer yet. So, but that's the kind of stuff I would look at to answer that question. Okay. Does anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And once again, we'll post this soon, along with some of the uh, links on this references page as well as uh, links to past uh, webinars I've done that address some of the questions that came up. Thank you very much for attending.